Hello and welcome to another episode of Forkful of Noodles. I am Krish Mohan. Hypermasculinity could be described as bros that could have used a hug. Men, men don't get hugs un unless they are bear hugs. Men can hug when it's culturally appropriated from another animal and can kill. Hypermasculinity is described as a psychological condition for the exaggerations of male stereotypes. These stereotypes have been contributed to so many issues that we've seen, and now we are confronting them in society. The stereotypes of hypermasculinity can lead to limiting definitions of what a man is. One influence is the American hypermasculine ideal, which is wholly very toxic and unbalanced in how it, our boys become men. On the opposite side of this ideal is an anti-masculinity, a man that grows up to be open-minded, well-spoken, intelligent, and generally a very balanced whole view of the world. Within the context of hypermasculinity, men are providers, protectors, and procreators. So what's driving it? I think it's our take on what it is to be a man. So our traditional view of masculinity holds that men should be, among other things, providers, protectors and procreators, with guiding behaviours like aggression, competitiveness and toughness and risk-taking as, as, as guiding behaviours that, that form a metaphorical map with which we walk through manhood or navigate through manhood. So that basically means jobs, guns, and fucking. Combine all three and you are the top dog alpha male. So that basically means the gun-toting male prostitutes are the alphaist of all the alpha males. The one that the legends of hypermasculinity speak of. The ones that movies like Rambo and Die Hard have tried so hard to emulate. For that matter, it restricts and limits the definitions of what a woman can be. With restrictive definitions of what a man is, it ensures what a man isn't. Men cannot show emotions of love or grief or fear. Those are reserved for females. You know, but they, they can hug without killing, but if a female hugs a man, she is also risking her life because of that earlier restrictive killer hug rule we talked about. Things are even restrictive in what men and women can wear. Joan of Arc is a prime example of those restrictive ideologies in full effect. Joan of Arc was a French hero. She was thought to be a prophetic figure that was supposed to bring glory to France in the early 1400s and the coronation of King Charles. This makes total sense. French crowns are very decadent and shiny with their jewels and their gold. So the coronation of a real man can only come from a woman's love of shiny shit since that was the common thought of the day. It, it's either that or, uh, or a monkey could, could do it because they also like shiny shit. But, you know, monkeys don't live in France. It's, uh, it's way too turbulent for monkeys. Despite the challenges of gender stereotypes of the day, Joan of Arc was confident that she would lead the French to victory because she had spoken to the Lord and they said it was totally cool. She also cut her hair and dressed like a man in the heat of battle. And when she was executed, she was accused of heresy and witchcraft and dressing like a man, along with 70 other things. Now, the heresy and the witchcraft was because she claimed that she could talk to God. And at that point in human history, the belief was that women's ears, they were, uh, they were just too weak to hear the voice of God. You know, a big booming ethereal figure speaking to the dainty soft ears of a woman was sure to destroy her and just leave two smoldering breasts in the wake the fact that dressing like a man 
was a crime is kind of peculiar. In fact, it was declining those allegations that signed her death warrant. She denounced her divinity, effectively breaking up with God. I mean, God, God took it pretty hard and hasn't been seen since. But she wouldn't denounce the clothing. The English wouldn't have it because, because they wear the pants in this authoritarian, imperialist, globalist domination. So they burned her at, at the stake, which I doubt God would have been happy about. Now, I think Joan of Arc was trying to spare the egos of these men, right? If, if the English soldiers were beaten by a warrior in a frilly dress and a corset and a gorgeous pony with bows in her hair, they would have probably gone insane. Women were considered to be these fragile bringers of life and they needed to be protected. So when that life makes it out into the world, Men can destroy it. And usually these are men that are you know, all about preserving and protecting the sanctity of life so they can destroy it. Hence our society's current obsession with never-ending war. But the egos of hypermasculinity are so fragile that in order to preserve their stereotypical roles, they had to make sure that she was killed. And a major part of these issues in hypermasculinity and the, and the behavior is the size and fragility of the male ego. The hypermasculine ego is like a frozen ocean. It's vast, it's ever expanding, and it's trapping a lot of shit below the surface. And one crack and the whole thing crumbles and we're left wet and struggling in the water because no one taught these men how to swim. Learning shit is also feminine. You, you can't kill anybody with a book. Before we parted, he said to me, you're either guarded by your soul or driven by your ego. It is only a matter of choice. And for me, these words were absolutely life-changing because they initiated a change or a move away from what I perceived to be manly or not. It altered the map that I'd been referring to most of my life. The ego is what drives the competition with these stereotypical gender roles. And the only thing this ego is trying to prove that it's worth something to other men doing the same thing. Scrutiny from other men is a major flaw of hypermasculinity. It creates this feedback loop and inhibits these men from forming real relationships. The scrutiny is what makes these men look at women as conquests instead of people. They don't want a partner that they can become a better person with. They want a trophy wife, gilded on a mantle to, to show off for these other men in their group, a crown to look pretty and nothing more. This competitive behavior is what leads to misogyny and homophobia and racism from these hypermasculine men. I mean, dudes are already in competition with other dudes, right? Who's got the hotter wife or who's got the biggest car there by the smallest penis or, or who can bench the most amount of weight or has the most amount of money. And the winners of these contests get the alpha male of the group award and they get to shoot off their guns during sex. That is the law of the hypermasculine tribe, okay? These are old rituals and old rules meant to appease a very old god who, to them, is a super ripped dude banging broads whether they want it or not. So when we add women and minorities and LGBTQ community folks into the mix, that's just more competition for men who are already competing with each other. Hypermasculinity is just so exhausted from competing with itself. The vastness of their egos will always be bigger than their own dicks. And losing these competitions means that these men are not providers or, or protectors or procreators. It means that they don't have power, and that's the crux of being a man. Power. And... Now, the manliest thing, you know, anybody could ever do, like the manliest of all men, you know, the, the one that the prophecies of Brodom have been speaking of for generation is one man that can generate enough power from one flex of his muscle to, like, power the entire city. But power 
is important for hypermasculinity to wield over groups like women and minorities and the LGBTQ communities because because of slavery black men were seen as helpless right Irish and the Italians were seen as too emotional uh, and passionate Jews were looked at as too bookish Asians were too soft and brittle and women uh, well, the, they were, of course, property, uh, which is proven by the uh, beautiful poetry of uh, Bitches Be Shopping. But in order to deviate from sympathy, because men do not do that, they had to show their dominance with hypocritical arguments. Right, Black men were helplessly vandalizing women, and women were carnal and need to be sheltered from that animalistic behavior. The gays were... were too sexually insatiable, and there is only room for loving and fucking God. Now, Asians were torturers and, and have a valid driver's license as their tool for it. Southern Europeans were, were pervs and, and sexual predators. Only the white Anglo-Saxon male was pure in stoicism, middle-class work ethic, and blue jeans that will eventually be sung about in a Bruce Springsteen song. Stoicism is how this power is wielded. Even though these men are supposed to be aggressive risk takers, they have to push all of that anger down. Hypermasculinity is so bad that it's oppressing anger. Now, all of this is driven by fear, right? The fear uh, that the ocean of ego will crumble and all that's left is a hurricane of repressed emotion the need for hugs, and the entire Adele collection. Besides and all, and if that's the case, then nobody will want to procreate with them, right? They can't protect or provide for anyone. And not only is that embarrassing, it also leaves them without a sense of purpose for what they're supposed to be. That's a huge revelation about hypermasculinity. Embarrassment is its biggest weakness. Right, most women fear like rape and murder and, and the inability to lose five pounds. But men are afraid that the secrets of liking unmasculine things will surface. And I mean, that's really what kryptonite does to Superman. It reveals his love for knitting and he has no option but to start killing himself from the inside out. Hypermasculinity's restrictive definitions of what a man is and, and what they should be leads to more anger, silence, and violence. These rules inhibit a person from realizing who they truly are, what they love, and the ability to show that love. The idea that men have to adhere to these roles and that the fact that they are in charge ignores their humanity and their emotions. It puts them to act as if they were beyond human, like a god. And, and it's what the cool Greek gods, okay, with the abs and the lightning bolts, not, not those pansy Hindu gods that read and talk about education and love. And being god is, is exhausting. I mean, it's slightly less exhausting than being in competition with your own ego, but god is tired. Okay, that's why God is always talking to people to do their bidding. You know, they don't want to keep magicking things for us. They want us to be able to take care of each other so the Lord can retire in some faraway Fibonacci sequence. And hypermasculinity is perpetuated by hyperfemininity, which falls into the same category of restrictive rules. There are women that want the hypermasculine guys. They... They still want to be taken care of and be seen as these fragile bringers of life that need to be protected. And these men are going to do that. They are more keen on physical prowess rather than intellect and problem-solving skills, empathy, and emotional balance. And part of the discussion and limitations of these restrictive rules is the physical versus the brain. There's a major pushback to intellect and I do plan on talking about anti-intellectualism uh, in the future uh, at full length and more in depth but the value of physical power versus the mental is an age-old argument. Hypermasculinity doesn't care about working smarter 
as long as you work harder and there's still a purpose for you within these old rules and stereotypes. But it's hard to get hypermasculine dudes to see the negative effects of stoicism and aggression, competition, and devaluing other people to try add value to yourself without knowing yourself. The frozen ocean of the ego breaks and that water is a shock to the system that can lead to just more aggression. They punch that water and that doesn't really do anything. You have to ease the transition. It's like going into a pool one foot at a time and eventually you'll be able to go all the way underwater, look up and get a new perspective. And this is where the Me Too movement comes in. This is probably one of the most powerful movements against hypermasculinity at this point. But it has the potential to educate and change gender stereotypes for the next generation. But my concern with the movement is the direction that it'll take. You know, I, I think we should be aware of the severity of the punishment based on the misuse of masculinity and the power that is derived from it. At the moment, it seems like we're just drowning everybody, and that's really not fair. Teach them to swim if you can, and if they're willing to learn. Harvey Weinstein is a monster that was created by an overfed ego, amongst other things. But Louis C.K. wasn't. Now, that doesn't mean that I think what Louis did was okay. I, I don't, but the guy had a fetish and didn't know how to express it. Other men he knew didn't really have that fetish and neither did they talk about it if they did. So he competed with the other men and his ego and he lost. Louis is taking time for personal growth and so is Al Franken, but do these men need to have their lives destroyed just like Harvey Weinstein? You know, do we need to scorch the earth with the memories of semi-decent dudes that made an error? How are we supposed to distinguish between something truly horrible that was that derived from a misuse of power and was clearly abuse and, and uh, rape and sexual misconduct on the highest level to something that was a slip-up but can still be considered a sexual mis misconduct and still give these people a, a chance to come back. The same goes for Aziz. And look, I am not defending Aziz Ansari's actions. Everybody knows that he's made my stand-up career a lot harder since that's all I get compared to. But he took a lady out on a horrendous date. But he apologized, and she could have used verbal cues and left. Be a badass like Joan of Arc. And, you know, you could have... You could have crowned him like King Bad Date or, or a, the true master of none. No tact and no class. Master of none. And that story has all the trappings of hyperfemininity that could send the Me Too movement in the wrong direction. The direction of shaming men for bad behavior, which leads them to retreat internally, getting angry and possibly even violent. We can be educating them about the latent hypermasculine tendencies that even tiny men like Aziz and the pudgy dudes like Louis C.K. have. But guys like Aziz and Louis falls in, fall into the trap of hypermasculine conquest without even realizing it, right? Go on a date and treat the other person with some damn respect and not as a receptacle for your sexual frustrations so you can high five your buddies over a drink at the bar right hotel rooms are for private and anonymous masturbations that are later revealed on an expose on channel four hopefully these men come back uh, into the light as better people that can respect women and themselves just a little bit more this movement is in its infancy it can help redefine masculinity and help create a culture of acceptance instead of brutal competition that ends in physical and emotional wounds. This movement can teach men that they can redeem themselves through honesty and letting go of their ego and respecting those that are different than them. Maybe if God would have just opened up a little bit 
about their breakup with Joan of Arc and how it really affected them. Maybe hypermasculine dudes wouldn't see them as this buffed, ripped, kind of naked dude hanging out in the clouds. You know, maybe maybe the vision of God would be like this super sensitive, uh, nerdy kid that uh, that dr- draws and speaks about the human condition and how we should learn how to love and accept each other and, you know, has uh, majestic, long, be- beautiful hair. Also, atheists would believe that you exist. So there, there's a positive in that, too. The next generation needs to see that there are... There is some redemption for slip-ups and and what truly extreme behavior looks like. If not, Me Too could slip into perpetuating the problem like hyperfemininity, and that is going to lead to either like no hugs or 100% death by hugs. That has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, please do us a huge favor. Uh, and hit the like button and the share button. Uh, Sharing is caring, and it is a great way to help DIY independent comedy and DIY independent media such as this uh, reach bigger audiences. Uh, There are various things that are censoring the reach uh, of independent content like this, and uh, and you can change that. You can help us out by by sharing sharing the links um, that that, uh, you listen to. Uh, share it with your friends and share it with your enemies, whoever you think would benefit from hearing something like this. Uh, if you would like to come see me live, I have live stand-up comedy shows coming up in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, Montgomery, Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama, Memphis, Tennessee, and St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I'm going to be on tour with Andrew Frank. You can check out our entire tour schedule at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, also, well, while you're there, you can check out uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, we've launched a few new projects. We've updated a few projects. Uh, of, one of the projects you can get is, well, you can get all of my stand-up comedy on Bandcamp, and you can also subscribe to get exclusive unreleased comedy material every single month this includes uh sets that were you know mostly rift uh interview sessions fringe festival sets storytelling shows uh things that i don't normally do in my in my live stand-up act or or things i only do once or twice in my live stand-up comedy act so uh that is available uh at ramen noodles comedy.bandcamp.com uh and that is only for five dollars a month you can get all of the unreleased stuff uh, while you're there, you can check out a new project called The Dispatch, uh, which is somewhat similar to Forkful of Noodles, but instead of c- uh, covering big ideas in depth, it's uh, smaller news stories, big ideas in short bursts, or a couple road stories. That's exclusively available only on my Bandcamp for free to everybody. Uh, if you would like to continue supporting this show, uh, just beyond sharing and liking, you can donate to my Patreon that I've relaunched. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. That's where you can find all the rewards, what what the Patreon supports, um, and all the goals uh, that I'm trying to achieve through this show, uh, helping create a community, um, trying to do more live events that would revolve around uh, a, sh- a show like this, and my podcast, Taboo Table Talk. So go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha uh, to donate there. Uh, lots of cool stuff coming up, guys. I'm very excited to be on the road. Very excited to see some of you guys uh, out at some live events. So uh, if you're out, if you watch this and uh, and I'm coming to one of your cities, come hang out. I uh, love and we'll 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 chat after the show, get a drink uh, and stuff like that. So uh, again, tour dates at ramennoodlescomedy.com. Uh, all the unreleased exclusive stand-up comedy material at ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com. Uh, and if you want extra support, you can go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. You can donate a little, donate a lot. All of my content will always be available to you guys for free. Donating to the Patreon just shows a little extra appreciation and helps me meet my goals and helps you guys um, truly be listener supported. That's what it makes this show. It makes it truly listener supported. You guys can interact with the Patreon and tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like, tell me if there are topics I should cover, uh, and we can truly start a conversation and build a community around big ideas and hopefully try to figure out some solutions. But 
Till next week, thanks for getting into it, and we'll see you on the road.